And welcome to another episode of Time About the Movies Flashback. We're flashing back to September 16th, 1988. With five films, and you would think at least one of them would be someone memorable or something that I have seen. Not as either the case, so we can get through this one pretty quickly. So let's just go ahead and jump on into it. And you know this weekend is bad when, new, when the biggest new release coming out this weekend is a Charles Bronson Cannon film. This is Messenger of Death. Charles Bronson is investigating a senseless massacre that's become an explosive confrontation. This idea of murdering people to save them, it's crazy. A mysterious cult is seeking revenge, and Charles Bronson is the only one who can stop them. Looks like we got a live one here. Charles Bronson, messenger of death. Now playing at a theater near you. Check your local listings rated 14 years limited admission. So Charles Bronson's in this movie about an attempt by a water company to start a family feud among fundamentalist Mormons to take the family's land from the company. Uh, this is the eighth collaboration between Bronson and director J. Lee Thompson going back to St. Ives in 76, White Buffalo, Cabo Blanco in 80, 10 to Midnight, The Evil Met Men Do, Murphy's Law, and Death Wish for the Crackdown. And uh, the last one these two would do together would be For Kinji Forbidden Suspects, which came out the year after this. Um... I've got nothing on this one. It doesn't look at it. I've never seen it. But considering that it is a canon film, it's probably not that good. And even if it is good, it's a so bad it's good type of film. You could pretty much just make this a Death Wish sequel, honestly, from the looks of the trailer for this. It's, there's nothing about this that looks anything too spectacular or anything too riching whatsoever. I mean, it just literally looks like another Death Wish movie, except to have Charles Bronson not play the character from Death Wish. But, um,. Then again, I haven't seen the film, so I can't really say for certain, but um, that's just what I got from the trailer for it. So, um, not much more on that one. On to the next movie, which I did not know Run DMC had a movie to, to, back in the 80s, but they did, and it was called Tougher Than Leather. So this was a companion film to their fourth studio album at the time, which was also called Tougher Than Leather. And you have a story that has, at the beginning of the film, DMC, Daryl McDaniels, is released from prison, at which time he returns to New York City with his bandmates, Run Joseph Simmons and Jam Master Jay, Jason Mazzell. They are ready to schedule some gigs and kickstart their musical careers while things take a dark turn. Their friend, Ronnie Ray, which is uh, played by Raymond White, has been murdered by Vic Ferrente, played by Rick Rubin, the director of this movie. This pulls the group into a seedy world of crime and violence. Vic and the police cover up the murders to look like Ray was killed due to a drug deal gone wrong. As member members attempt to determine who was responsible for the murder, their own lives become endangered. They take matters into their own hands by trying to find Ray's killer. However, the action is balanced with a series of musical performances by the stars and other late 1980s hip-hop stars, including Slick Rick and Beastie Boys. Um... I literally never heard of this movie until now. Um, I did not even know it was Run DMC until I actually saw the trailer for this. Um, but um, considering how this does not have the best reviews and was not a big hit on video cassette and hasn't even had a DVD release and it's been long since out of print, chances are this movie was not memorable by a lot of people. And I guess when they when people compared this to black exploitation in a way, but. Um, I mean, I don't know. I didn't really get a black exploitation vibe to it. In fact, from the trailers that I saw for this, I don't even think that they, that was what the direction was they were going for. I feel like that was kind of like a last-ditch effort to try to save this movie from all the criticisms that were going on with it. But, um, but uh, yeah, as far as I know, it's not a movie that most people remember, not even the biggest Run DMC fans. But, um, I mean, the Beastie Boys are in it, so that's got to be something, I guess. But um, I just feel... It's, I mean, I don't know. This trailer does not look, look like it's... This trailer doesn't really look like it's selling the movie the right way. I don't even know if the movie's any good or not, honestly. But uh, the soundtrack I, heard, I see has gotten a lot of praise for it. But, um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I know about this movie, honestly. I don't really know too much more about it. So that's tougher than leather. So on to our next movie that I've never heard of. Richard Gere in Miles From Home.
yeah, that's not really a whole lot of footage there for me to go on, but um, evidently this was the first thing directed by Gary Sinise, and actually the first thing that people even knew who he was, because before this, it was a film he did in 1973 as a cameo, but other than that, it took him 15 years to finally get known by Hollywood, and here's the film that shows it. Uh, Richard Gere, Kevin Anderson, they're playing two brothers who, after being forced off their farm in the debt stricken in Midwest United States, become folk heroes when they begin robbing the banks that have been foreclosing on farmers. Um, uh, apparently, Gary Sinise uh, directed this. He co-wrote. He wrote it with a uh, Chris. No, he didn't write this with the writer. This Chris Jeromo. Uh, the film uses many members of Chicago's Steppenwolf Theater Company, as which Sinise is a co-founder. Uh, again, I really don't know too much about this film, honestly, to say if it's any good or not. But it's got a good cast to it. Richard Gere. I mean, if Richard Gere stars in a movie and you probably never heard of it, chances are the movie is not that memorable. With Despite the fact that Gear was one of the big stars in Hollywood around this time. I mean, you also have names like Penelope Ann Miller, Helen Hunt, Terry Kinney, uh, Brian Dennehy, Laurie Metcalf, Judith Ivey, John Malkovich is in this, Laura San Giacomo. Too many good talent in this movie, but it's a film that nobody really remembers, and I hardly ever hear anybody talk about it or even see any trailers for it. Like I said, that's the only clip I could find from it, so I don't know if it's any good or not, but... Um, if a, if a movie comes out with Richard Gere in 1988 and nobody really knows about it, chances are the movie isn't that memorable to begin with, so I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I hope you're enjoying this, because mostly I've never seen any of these movies, so we're getting through these pretty quickly. So um, on to our next film, and that is Bo Bridges in Seven Hours to Judgment. Fine. Then he became a victim of the law. And make this decision with great reluctance. Now David Reardon is tired of being a victim, and there's hell to pay. You gotta listen to reason! I sentence you to spend seven hours in the city you made or your wife dies. I'm trying to save my wife, Dan, but I'm running out of time! Ron Liebman, Julianne Phillips, Seven Hours to Judgment. So a street gang ends up raiding this guy's wife and leaves her half dead, the guy played by Ron Lieberman. Uh, when the gang is brought to court, she still lies down in a coma, so Judge Eden, played by Bo Bridges, has to let them go on a lack of evidence. Uh, Ritter believes it was Eden's fault and takes revenge. He kidnaps Eden's wife and threatens to kill her if he doesn't find the proof against the punks in seven hours. In panic, Eden starts erring around in the night to find a, wi a witness, and... That tr that uh, judging by that tr that um, premise alone, this seems like a really stupid idea for a movie to be released in theaters. This seems like a TV movie of the week you would see on NBC or CBS in the 1980s. Or, he's but um, Bo Bridges is in here, so th there's that. He also directed it too. I su I'm surprised to see that one of the co-writers. Of this is also with Stephen E. D'Souza, who actually wrote this under the pseudonym Elliot Stevens. But of course, he went on to write uh, forty. He went on to write a lot, a lot of action films we've covered in the past. Forty Eight Hours, Com another Forty Eight Hours, uh, The Running Man, Die Hard, uh, Commando, Hudson Hawk, Judge Dredd. Uh, Tiny Zeus Lister is in this film as well. I think. Is it him? No, it's not Tiny Zeus. It's, no, it's not Tiny Zeus. No, it's Al from The Naked Gun. That's too, com very different. Tiny Z Tiny T Sister, like. It's not, in fact, it's not even his name. What the hell am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm really struggling to find some stuff on this movie, man, because I really don't, I really don't think it's any good. I mean, this is a film that just feels like it should be the movie of the week on TV or something like that. This, like, it just feels like too much is going on in this movie to really make it something that needs to be put on a big screen, and I just don't see it, man. But the, like, this movie's really confusing to me because I'm getting my information all wrong on here, but um. Uh, let's wrap this one up. Let's get the heck out of here with our next, with our last film, Keanu Reeves and Fred Ward in The Prince of Pennsylvania. Yeah, yet another movie you can't really find a good trailer for, and 
you see that that's a different language altogether. So that just pretty much tells you everything you know, need to know about the legacy this movie has. Uh, the story is that there's nothing wrong with the Marchetta family that a little felony can't cure. Rupert, uh, played by Keanu Reeves, doesn't want to follow in his father's blue-colored footsteps, so he and his quirky Fred kidnap his father for ransom, only nobody wants him back. Sounds like a thrilling premise to me, or not really, but um, Fred Ward, Keanu Reeves, Bonnie Bedelia is in this as well, so is Amy Madigan. Uh, I wish I had more for you. Uh, this director is Ron, Ron Niswainer. He also wrote um, Philadelphia, which he won an Oscar for, if I'm not mistaken. Did he win the Oscar for it, or... He got nominations, okay. He got nominated for the Oscar for Philadelphia. Philadelphia's a great movie, but um, this just feels like there's not really a whole lot there it's in terms of a premise or even a reason for its existence. I mean, again, it feels like a film that you would see as, like, the after-school special on ABC or even a TV movie of the week over on CBS, ABC, or NBC. But um, other than that, though, this is uh, this does not feel like a film that really deserves to be seen on a big screen. It's produced by Columbia Pictures. This was when David Putnam was doing that thing where he was taking smaller projects over bigger projects and trying to put those out there, hoping that that would help the studio out, and it didn't. And it led to so Sony and buying Columbia Pictures, which will turn 100 years old by the time this by the time this this time next year when this episode airs. Uh, so, but uh, yeah. I wish I had more for you, but that's The Prince of Pennsylvania. Well, that was not a very good week for movies, but uh, next time we do come back to a couple of notable films. We have Richard Dreyfuss in Moon Over Parador. We also have Running on Empty, which has River Phoenix in it, as well as Judd Hirsch, Track 29, and also Some Girls. So we have four movies to look at, a couple of notable films, so we should have more to talk about on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, Hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. I will see you guys next time for the next episode, so until then, as always, take care.